Hey, everybody. The great Dahlia Lithwick is my guest today. And well, 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 I'm feeling pretty cocky about this one. You know, for a change. Dahlia Lithwick, senior editor of Slate, who writes about the Supreme Court and the law and politics, and who's been with me here quite a number of times, and she always brings it. She's on at just the right moment. Uh, the 6-3 majority in the court has made it quite clear recently that they're not going to show a lot of restraint. And Dahlia looks back at what the decisions made by the court in the shadow docket this summer have meant and ahead to what damage they may very well inflict in their 2001 term that begins on Monday. Even higher stakes coming up on a Mississippi case that is on the court's docket, which would put a ban on abortion after 15 weeks. Uh, there's really a, a question whether Roe will, will even exist once this, this term is over. And you can't be discussing the law now without discussing voting rights and the shaky state of our, our democracy. As you'll hear from Dahlia, the stakes are enormous. Our democracy is facing an existential threat. There just can be no doubt about that. Two-thirds of Republicans believe the big lie, that the election was stolen. It wasn't, by the way. Only one of these things can be true. The election was stolen or the election was not stolen. It's not okay for two-thirds of one of our nation's two only major parties to believe something that has been shown not to be true over and over and over again. We're at a very dangerous place right now. On top of that, Republicans have been threatening to let the United States go into default and cause a worldwide economic disaster. Mitch McConnell has said that there will be not one Republican vote to raise the debt ceiling and that Democrats have to do it themselves so Republicans can use it as a cudgel in, in the midterms. And that's because he can do it. Even though Republicans have added to our debt with their $1.9 trillion tax cut in the various COVID relief bills while Trump was in office, but they can do it. It's time for Democrats to do what we can do. And on voting rights, we can carve out a rule that voting rights law, election law, that those can be changed with 51 votes. We can do that. Manchin was instrumental in writing the Freedom to Vote Act, a great piece of legislation put together by him, by Amy Klobuchar, by, by others. This is about the future of our democracy. Nothing works in this country anymore if we don't do this. We'll vote to raise the debt ceiling fine. We also need to vote to save our democracy. These are just some of the stuff that Dahlia Lithwick will be discussing today. It's a uh, super duper great one for a change. Hey, Dahlia. Hi, Al. Good to have you back. It's been a while. It's just always great to have you. And uh, we're about to enter the next, uh, what, what do you call it, the session of, of the Supreme Court? Or what do you call this thing? This will be called the 2021 term, term. which uh, opens on the first Monday of October. Okay, so they, we get to see them again. <laughs> we never stop seeing them. They've had the busiest summer certainly of my career, they couldn't stop. They were just doing it on the shadow docket. Yeah, well, you don't see them on the shadow docket. That's why it's called the shadow docket. That's why it's extra creepy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was really creepy. This was creepy. The decision in uh, the Texas abortion decision to me was the creepiest. I, I can't remember a creepier decision because it was overturning like constitutional <laughs> precedents, right? Uh, certainly in Texas. Uh, there's no more Roe v. Wade. I think that it was funny because in the weeks after that September 1st order, all the con law professors were fighting about whether we use the word overturn or nullify or reverse. And I was like, please, if you are 
anyone in Texas seeking to get an abortion at six weeks and one day, which is 90% of abortions in Texas, doesn't really matter if you use the word overturn, nullify, reverse, fail to enjoin, they can't get an abortion. So yeah, it was not just creepy, but, you know, uh, one and a half pages of like garbage logic and gobbledygook, unsigned opinion. We don't know who wrote it. And that's what it is. I, I thought Alito led that effort. No. It was appealed to him because he's the circuit justice who's in charge of the Fifth Circuit. Right. But we actually don't. Uh, part of the the real problem with the shadow docket is not only do you know, not know who the author is, those opinions are usually just unsigned orders. Sometimes there have been a couple of shadow docket opinions where we actually don't even know what the vote is. Like you can only get to five if there are four dissents. <laughs> That's how we knew there were five. But sometimes like there have been shadow docket orders where you don't know which way Amy Coney Barrett voted because there's no calculating the vote. I mean, don't get me started. But the idea that a court that grounds its entire legitimacy in showing its work <laughs> is now doing this like, hey, I like flipped over the napkin and wrote some stuff down and nobody signed it. And sometimes and then, like then the coffee leaked on it. Coffee now I can't on it. even read it myself. I don't even remember what I wrote. And I'm, you know, in, in some of the, the COVID cases, we had them citing their own shadow docket. <laughs> so that's doctrine. Like, hey, California, don't you, don't you read our shadow docket opinions that are three sentences long? That's the law. And it's insane. It's not just right back of the napkin. It's like back of the napkin referencing uh, the napkin that's like already been swept up and thrown away. It's insane. And it's, I mean, we can talk about this or not, but it's hilarious that the justices are running around screeching that they're not partisan when well, they do Well, that was her speech, like right? Uh, Coney Barrett's speech at the McConnell Center, which uh, is a great place for a, uh, a, a justice to declare that the court isn't partisan at the McConnell Center. And, and, and so this raises the question that we were all asking um, on the edit side at Slate when that happened, which is Amy Coney Barrett, is she clueless or does she just think we are? And, and what's your thought on that? Uh, I think it's, it could be both. <laughs> you can't eliminate that. Right? I, 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 I mean, I'm baffled. <laughs> I mean, I'm baffled that standing, like practically sitting on Mitch McConnell's lap and stroking his hair as, you know, this is the I don't guy. Wanna, I don't want to even imagine that. She, I mean, okay, sorry, but all I'm saying is this is the guy who has said the proudest thing I've ever done Stroking is my hair. That- <laughs> <laughs> you Justice just Barrett. You. you do you. I think that's inappropriate. <laughs> Here at the okay, McConnell Center, if you're going to say that you're not partisan, I think stroking my hair is sending in the wrong signal. <laughs> okay, let me let me say it differently. Mitch McConnell, the man who said the proudest moment of his career was stealing that Justice Scalia seat in 2016, keeping Merrick Garland from having it, and who has said explicitly, oh, by the way, if Republicans regain control of the Senate in 2022, Biden's never going to see a Supreme Court justice. Which is why Breyer should retire, right? Uh, Breyer has now devoted the last month, as you know, going on every single TV show and telling everyone that the court is not a political institution, that the justices do not make partisan political decisions. And please don't look at my dissent in that Texas order, (laughs) because that's a pretty partisan thing. Like, what you need to know is that when we get together and have lunch, we get along and everyone passes the carrot. I even forget which president nominated these people. We're so bipartisan. I, I can't remember, for example. Uh, Coney Barrett or Gorsuch or Kavanaugh, who, who that was. It, it was Trump, sir. Was it? Oh, yes. Yes. Now I remember. Well, okay. So can we make the one serious point that I would I would like to That was a serious make? point. It was satire. No, 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 no. You're, I mean, it's insane. And it's insane for Mitch McConnell, who, like, prides himself on 
essentially breaking every precedent and every norm of the Senate in order to mash people onto the court, then turns around and says, here is a good place for Amy Coney Barrett to give a good speech about how we're not partisan hacks. But the one thing I would just say is, you know, we are seeing this week Gallup polls, Marquette poll, Quinnipiac poll showing the Supreme Court has the lowest approval number, at least in the Gallup poll, since there has been a Gallup poll. It's like in the toilet. I think it's at 37 percent. And the justices look at those numbers and they're like, you know what I should do? I get- <laughs> I should issue a bunch of crap on the shadow docket, like reinstating the Remain in Mexico policy and striking down the eviction moratorium and upholding this unconstitutional law in Texas. And then I should really counter that move by giving a speech about how we're not partisan. It's banana. Like, what are they doing? Be nonpartisan. Do that. You know, I I questioned Gorsuch during the hearing when he said something, this isn't partisan. I said, well, then can you explain Merrick Garland? Why Why are you taking Merrick Garland's seat? What wasn't partisan about that? You you said uh, Merrick Garland was one of the finest, you know, was one of the finest <laughs> jurists in uh, around, and there was a lot of effort not to even give him a hearing. And you're saying your guys aren't political. Well, and Gorsuch, I think wasn't it Gorsuch who said that his first call when Donald Trump tapped him was to Merrick Garland? Can you imagine what that phone call? Was? <laughs> Sorry, I stole your seat, man. At least. Gorsuch had the good grace to look somewhat embarrassed about what had been done to Garland. The thing that Justices Kavanaugh and Barrett have really mastered is a sense of entitlement. Like, they earned that seat. Sorry about the fact that we, you know, were having hearings for me before Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in the ground. Sorry about the fact that voting had already started in the 2020 election in violation of the alleged uh, Mitch McConnell rule that you can't appoint someone. You know, the Biden rule, the The so-called Biden rule, rule, which wasn't the Biden rule at all, of course. She, She was sworn in nine days before the election. Yeah. No, voting voting had begun. And McConnell, you remember the original Biden rule was no president gets to appoint someone in the last year of his presidency, despite the fact that I think a full one third of U.S. presidents have done that. Uh, But then it became if Republicans control the majority and something, something, the court and also she's fancy, which is, I guess, the Amy Coney Barrett rule now. Yeah, uh, that kind of changed, didn't it? Well, I mean, I think that's part of the problem that I have, and maybe we could talk about (laughs) the Biden quote unquote commission to study structural court reform at the court. But I think part of the problem is that McConnell does this stuff because he can. And then instead of saying, well, now it's time to do commensurately hardball stuff because we can Democrats say things like, you know, this might be a good time for a commission. And I think that asymmetry is exactly the setup for McConnell to do the thing that you and I absolutely know he will do if the midterms give him uh, control of the Senate back, which is he will happily, happily if Stephen Breyer steps down or if someone else steps down. Take up somebody. Oh, yeah. Of course. So what what are we doing? Why are we why do we have a commission? Be, because we're uh, we for example, I talked to Elias a couple of days ago about the Freedom to Vote Act and about just voting rights, right? Mm-hmm. And there's just no question that we are in an existential threat right now about our democracy that the and that the only way to really deal with that, the Democrats can deal with what the Republicans are trying to do, which is allow partisans and states to overturn the election and, and suppress all these uh, votes in so many different ways and intimidate voters and intimidate poll uh, workers, all this stuff. The only way to counter that is to pass what we want to pass with 51 votes. That's the only way to do it. Yep. 
that's acting in the way that Mitch McConnell would act. But he keeps acting that way. I mean, we we have we don't do that once. Why don't we do it once? And then this is the existential threat, I think, to our democracy right now. There's a lot of stuff in the Freedom to Vote Act that is a response to stuff Republicans put in these state laws that were even worse than the stuff that we're trying to fight in the original, uh, this new response to the Lew- uh, John Lewis bill. Republicans responded to those two pieces of legislation by writing worse shit. And so that this new bill that Amy Klobuchar and, and Joe Manchin and others have crafted had to add a whole bunch of new protections because Republicans thought of us, uh, other ways to assault the right to vote. Yes. And I also think this is a mistake that the Democrats keep making, which is we say, ha ha ha, look at the crack in lawsuits. Ha ha ha, look at Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell and Lynn Wood. And wasn't that funny? And, you know, isn't constitutional law professor John Eastman, you know, who was writing a memo telling Mike Pence to set the election results aside. And we look at it and we're like, it's just hilarious because it's so artless and slapdash and shoddy. And what we don't realize is that while we're kind of laughing at that, this stuff is getting baked into, you know, some of this like independent state legislature stuff that I'm sure Mark Elias talks about better than I do. But some of these doctrines about giving states the ability to set aside their slate of electors, set, get giving unbelievable powers to increasingly polarized and political state election workers. I mean, this stuff is so not funny. And I think it's like not just that we're always fighting the last war, Al. It's like we're always laughing at the comedy of the last war and not realizing that the thing that is coming that is not hilarious, (laughs) that is very, very programmatic and systemic and it's everywhere. That stuff is not comedy. It's just existential, like you say. And I'm not sure that people like have wrapped their heads around what it means to empower state legislatures to set aside election results. And like 2022 elections is going to be like a bad day to find that out. They're coming at our throats with knives and we're laughing at it. Well, I just think again, and this is, you know, I, I say in the context of, you know, being a court watcher when people say, oh, look how moderate the John Roberts court was. They didn't set aside the election results in 2020 for Donald Trump. And I sort of am like, wait, they didn't take a Kraken lawsuit? Like they didn't actually throw out Pennsylvania votes? Like that doesn't make them moderate or centrist or respectful of election results. They were in the weeks before the 2020 election. Some of the stuff that, you know, Justice Alito, Justice Kavanaugh were putting in their opinions, in their individual opinions about empowering, you know, state legislatures and disempowering courts to review that stuff. That is crazy crap. And they were citing like a lone opinion from, you know, Rehnquist's Bush v. Gore (laughs) decision that didn't command a majority. I mean, it's really amazing that they are plowing the ground judicially for some of these outcomes. And we're laughing at Sidney Powell, but what they are seeding and the ways it could bear fruit in really, really near term is horrifying. And I just don't quite know how to take very seriously that which seemed ridiculous. To me, the mansion and cinema, and if there's anyone else standing in the way of doing this with 51 votes, including the vice president, that they, that this is exactly what they should be thinking about because they've made their, you know, their, this is Steve Bannon time. This is really bad people wanting to overthrow our democracy. This is Tucker Carlson time. This is Hungary. This is Brazil. We're at an existential crisis in our democracy. Like, I don't think we've been. And this is, you know, this is 1965 again. And we better act. 
I, I think that's right. And I think, uh, you know, there's a pretty grim piece uh, in the Post by Robert Kagan, of all people, essentially saying the Civil War is now. And Robert Kagan. Yeah. Wow. I know. For, I uh, think, for people to explain who Robert Kagan is and why that this is meaningful that it's from him. Well, I mean, I just <laughs> – this is not one of those, uh, quote, unquote, hysterics on uh, the lunatic – left. Uh, this is somebody who has been, you know, if anything, like one of the most establishment figures, right? Yeah. You know, part of the problem, and, you know, I, I don't know how much this is a through line in our conversations over the last few years, but I think it is, is that if you're a nihilist, you just break stuff. And it's just really easy to break stuff. And uh, it's just so easy to say, it's true, the Arizona audit was a joke. It turns out Biden won by more <laughs> than we thought. Now, and it how, how surprising is that? I mean, didn't you go like, well, this is not legitimate. These are partisans going in to do the thing that they're going to, they're going to throw votes out they're going to cheat they're going to do everything they can to make it look like trump won and they come back <laughs> and say <laughs> like, we, <laughs> he lost by more <laughs> he lost by more i mean i it, how surprised were you by that i was totally surprised because like you i thought the whole thing was a just vote fraud finding machine right that was the mission and there was nothing legitimate about it was like it. hitler <laughs> coming back in 1933 you know we lost <laughs> no, it's so strange. And I think this so, so shores up the point we were just making. Like, so you laugh it off, right? Like the cyber ninjas and it's a joke and ha ha ha. And this is my pillow. But the damage is done, right? When you look at the statistics of how many people believe the election was stolen, it doesn't matter. Like it's you two thirds of Republicans. Yeah. And you just, you can produce proof that the election was not stolen and apparently you cannot produce proof that it was despite your best efforts it doesn't matter the number of secretaries of state republican secretaries of state who think the election was stolen is a much more material figure than actual evidence of stolen elections and that's i think where we get wrong is we see what happened in arizona in that audit as vindication right whoa he really lost but it doesn't actually move the needle for any of the millions and millions of people who just now will look for the next piece of data that shows that the election was and stolen. And also, how transparent was it that Trump was just bullshitting all over the place to call Raffensperger and say, look, just find 11,780 votes, just one more than I need. I mean, can you imagine Raffensperger having that press conference? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm the uh, Secretary of State of the State of Georgia and uh, have an announcement. Um, there's been a change in the totals and the new winner of the election by one vote is Donald Trump. I don't know. Was there a recount? Uh, no. No. We just, we just found. 11,780 votes, and they're all for Trump? Yeah, yeah. I mean, how, 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 do, how does anyone believe that shit? The point is it almost doesn't matter what people believe because well, the only thing that matters is the doubt is sown. It has fomented, right? It's no longer this comedy of stop the steal and people in hats. Now it is systematically 16 states <laughs> have passed measures this year, shifting election authority away from the Raffensburgers, away from any, you know, nonpartisan entity or even responsible entity and giving it to the legislatures. And that's happening. And so I think, again, you know, we're hounding those people out of office. Anyone who even had a faint 
at pretending to be a, a serious election official is leaving office. They're being replaced by partisans. And you, we can sit and relitigate Georgia, or we can look at the fact that even Raffensperger was fine with the Georgia vote suppression bill, right? Like, turns around and says, okay, no fraud in Georgia. I did my job. It was a clean election. But now let's make sure that people can be arrested for handing out food to folks who are going to stand in line in Atlanta for six hours. Like, that's bonkers. And so I think the, the, the product here is not the election data. It's the doubt. And what they are selling is the doubt. And that is the thing that you and I cannot control. And the doubt is seeding the ground for really scary, as you say, Hungary-style election intervention. Which is why cinema and mansion and whoever it takes has to go like, you know what? What would they do? What would McConnell do in our place? We know what they would do. And we have to do it because they're actually evil. See, we're the good guys on this. We <laughs> we want people we want to have fair elections. That's what we want. So we're the good guys. They're the bad guys. We know what they would do. And we can do it. We can do it. We can do it. One other thing that I think is really important is this is why this fight, this sort of Stacey Abrams fight, like it doesn't matter what they pass. We'll just outvote them. Doesn't work, right? Because all the get out the vote, all the get out the vote that you do doesn't matter if you are creating a legal regime in which they're going to throw all those votes out. And so I think, you know, we keep saying we'll just organize around it or, you know, voter suppression isn't that bad because it galvanizes, you know, blue votes. But I think we are not reckoning seriously with the kinds of I think shift. that worked in t through 2020. Yep. And barely. But it doesn't yep. work any past that. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how much we win by in Georgia. It doesn't matter how much we're going to. We went by in Arizona or Pennsylvania or Michigan or, or Wisconsin. That doesn't matter. Yep. Okay, let's talk about uh, the shadow docket. And I can't remember if we've covered this already. I'm so mad about it. Uh, is the, the, the Texas decision on abortion. I think we touched on it. And is this wrong to believe this, that Alito is not – uh, dealing in good faith? I think that faith is such a great word. I mean, I think that we know that Justice Alito, Justice Thomas are coming at this from a, a place where they really do feel that, that they are the voices of a beleaguered faith community that has had all sorts of things, including abortion, including marriage equality, uh, including rights for transgender Americans, that that is being foisted on uh, religious dissenters in a way that they have to fight for. And both Justice Alito and Clarence Thomas have written about things like Obergefell, that was the marriage equality decision, sure. as just a slap in the face to uh, religious believers. I know and Alito I think, has, has, as Thomas as well. Thomas has as well. And I think we just need to brace ourselves for uh, a docket that more and more. What is, is gonna... what do they see as the harm other than, uh, very religious people who don't believe in same sex marriage are very offended? I mean, what is, <laughs> what is the harm in that? What it's is, such, if... <laughs> it's exactly the question. And, I, 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 you know, the Alito, the Justice Alito speech that he gave about this last year was so eye popping because what he doesn't like is being called hater. He doesn't like being construed. And ironically, his response to that is to hate. Yeah. No, I mean, it's really interesting. He feels as though it has no. forced him into this you defensive posture. You forced me posture. to hate. Yeah. And, and now I'm a hater because you called me a hater and now I hate that and I'm trapped. It's, it's, you know, one of the things, like you mentioned SB8, that's the Texas abortion bill. And I think one of the things that defenders of the court's decision not to jump in, right? So they failed to jump in and enjoin the thing. And so effectively by September 1st, 
it doesn't matter what the Constitution says. It, you cannot get an abortion uh, after, quote unquote. They uh, did a jump in. They jumped well, exactly. in by not saying, no, you can't do that. That's jumping in. Of course. <laughs> and, and, this, and this. to say we can't do it, our hands are tied because they passed this bill to tie our hands is hilarious. We're the Supreme Court. We're the ones who are supposed to stop this. This is unconstitutional. We're the Supreme Court. And you're expecting us on the uh, shadow docket to say, oh, no, go ahead and do an unconstitutional thing, which is overrule Roe v. Wade. Something that's been, you know, that's starry decisis. No, no, no. You can do that if you're a, a circuit court. It's fine. Circuit courts can overrule us if enough of us agree with it. No, you have to have like arguments <laughs> and you have to have like briefs and like amicus briefs, like your show, Amica, Amicus, Amiki, Amiki. So, so uh, you 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 keep going for a little while, um, and and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say this one thing because I think a lot of otherwise respectable left leaning legal academics said, "Oh, you know, the court did the right thing by not jumping in on the shadow docket." You know, critics of the shadow docket don't like when the court jumps in, and and I just want to say that it is amazing to me that people can say that when the court was jumping all over the place on the shadow docket in the COVID cases, right? You've got a religious adherent who doesn't like the the limits on how many people can go to church or go to Bible study. The court totally willing to leap in those cases and act. And that is seen as a dignitary injury, right? Like these poor people who just want to worship and mean, you know, Gavin Newsom isn't letting them worship. So I just think the problem with the shadow docket, in addition to, like you say, <laughs> no arguments, barely briefed, we don't have a court record below. In addition to that, it's just freaking feelings ball. It's just the court saying, I feel bad for that guy. Don't feel bad for that guy. You know, super, super sorry for the guy who wants to worship in COVID. That guy needs immediate emergency relief. And the second most populous state in the country, 10% of the women of childbearing age in the United States affected by SB8, yeah, don't feel super sorry for them. Let's let this play out in the courts. Let 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 these providers get sued 50 times and go bankrupt, and then they can bring a lawsuit and we'll figure it out. And I think part of the, I'm not even showing my work, this hasn't been briefed, uh, I'm not bothering to sign the opinion, by the way, the opinion is four lines, but really the indignity of it is what the court considers an emergency. And what they consider an emergency is entirely driven by their own feelings. I agree with everything you just said, but to me, even the bigger argument is that they're allowing a circuit court to overturn a decision made by the Supreme Court. Correct. In other words, that's not what circuit courts are supposed to do. I mean, every time I would, on the Judiciary Committee, ask a question of you know, someone who's up for a circuit court, they would go like, no, I have to honor stare decisis. I have to honor stare decisis. I have to honor stare decisis, you know? And you may think I'm really, really conservative, but don't mistake me for being nominated for the Supreme Court. This is the Supreme Court going like, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Circuit courts are free willy-nilly to overturn precedents. That's my beef. No, and you're you're exactly right. That's where they lose John Roberts, right? I mean, in June Medical, which was the the big abortion case last term that we thought maybe we could go like, I don't know, five minutes without another abortion case. And that case had John Roberts voting with the court's liberals, not because he loves abortion. He's voted against every single, you know, if he could, he would single-handedly, I think, uh, do away with Roe. And that was because they had just voted- In whole women's health, right. They had just decided- the identical issue, this was about those trap laws, those clinic closures in Texas. This was Lu Louisiana trying to do the same thing. And John Roberts saying exactly what you're saying, like, hey, 
we'll decide if we're going to overturn Roe, but you don't get to do it in the lower courts. And also, and this goes to this super, super important point about stare decisis, right? He's like, the law is the law. People rely on it. Whether I agreed or not in whole women's health, and by the way, I did not, uh, you don't just get to willy-nilly reverse court precedent because the composition of the court changes. And in a weird way, the thing that is so scary about Amy Coney Barrett, and it really was materially clear at her confirmation hearing, she kind of doesn't believe in stare decisis. She's kind of up there with Clarence Thomas, at least in her writings, saying, eh, you know, if if a decision is wrong, it's just wrong. And we, we know because at her confirmation hearings, she wasn't willing to say, you know, that Roe is is super precedent, whatever that means. She well, wasn't that, to that's say- sort of uh, something they've all grabbed onto, not being, you know, I, I can talk about that. That's a tradition now that we've blah, 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 blah. The thing that struck me most in that, there are two things with her. Uh, one is that uh, she lied uh, to Leahy. When he asked her about this uh, right-wing Christian group, the Alliance Defending Freedom, and he asked her if she knew that they were, f- they were for recriminalizing homosexuality, and she said no. And I had asked her the same damn question in 2017 at her confirmation hearing then for the circuit court. And at the time, she said the same thing. No, I didn't know that. Well, she had given five speeches to them, five paid speeches to them. And not only that, when she had that uh, event in the Rose Garden, when President Trump announced that she was the nominee and everybody who was there knew that that's what this whole event was about, they were there. The, The president and CEO of the Alliance to Defend Freedom was at the Rose Garden. Now, That's kind of a hot ticket, you know, and you'd think she signs off on who gets that ticket. So she's lying. She was lying. The the, the Southern Poverty Law Center considers them a hate group. She was lying. And then uh, Amy Klobuchar says, yeah, is uh, voter intimidation illegal? You remember this part of the hearing? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. she goes, huh, I don't know. What? You know. You know. You're lying. You can't lie to us. Okay, but can I offer you the unified theory of everything we've just said? Because sure. I just figured it out right this second. Good. Wow. And it's never I crystallized happened. crystallized something. The, the group is Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, and and oh. do you want to put in the thing where Michael Ferris, who leads it, then like – Show, shows up at the at the White House uh, when she's nominated at the yeah. mm-hmm. at the spreader event mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. the no mask where like nine yeah. uh, people got COVID, including okay, so, Chris Christie. So so let's can I do forty seconds on my unified theory of everything we just figured out right now? Yeah, because this never happens. I, this is a great moment. I'm. Do, do you remember? Do you remember when I said that the point? of the Kraken and the point of the Arizona audit and the point of all of these vote suppression bills is doubt. It's to, that's the product, right? We're creating doubt because if enough Americans doubt that the election was legitimate, then you can pass more voter suppression laws, right? Amy Coney Barrett, I think, did exactly that in her hearing. What the product that she was creating in her confirmation hearing was doubt. Because by saying, maybe voter suppression isn't illegal, you know, maybe- uh, Intimidation. Intimidation. Maybe voter intimidation isn't illegal. Maybe uh, Griswold versus Connecticut really isn't super precedent. You know, I think she said, Roe v. Wade can't be considered precedent because too many people doubt it. And so I just want to point out it's a perfect freaking circle. Like what they are producing is doubt in the, in her case, you know, the precedent. If if everybody says Roe is bad law, it can't be bad law. And I further that project by announcing today that I to doubt Roe, but it's exactly the same circular project as 
casting doubt on election results. It's just saying over and over again, if enough people believe that the Michigan election was stolen, it must have been stolen. If enough people believe that Griswold versus Connecticut, a landmark case that Neil Gorsuch has no problem with, John Roberts has no problem with. It's the case that protected the right for married people to get contraception. But Amy Coney Barrett willing to say, hey, I'm not super sure about that one. And what it does is it moves it from the column of things we believe to be true and immutable into the column of stuff that's up for grabs. And I think to the extent that I am positing a unified theory of something, it's that that is the motion. Like the move here on every front is to just produce doubt. Because the more you produce doubt, the more people doubt things. And whether it's the election, whether it's belief in the the right to vote, or whether it's binding precedent, all you're doing, this is the nihilist move. So I don't know if that's in any way of any utility to you, but it occurs to me it's the same move. I agree with all of it except one thing. Okay. And and this, this point, which is, is voter intimidation a crime? I, I'm not saying is it, it, it should it be? <laughs> is, has it been wrongly decided that voter, we have a perfect, we should have a perfect right to intimidate voters. <laughs> but it's a crime. Here it is in black and white. It's a crime. That's different than Griswold was wrongly decided. This is, lady, is it a crime? I got you. You're right. You're right. It's 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 taking something that is completely perfectly settled in the statute book right in front of you. That's what you're saying. Yeah. It yeah. is, um, I don't know, slugging someone a crime. Yes, it is. <laughs> I mean, you know, is assault a crime? Yes, it is. Okay, should it be? I don't know, but but it is, isn't it? Yes, you agree with that, right? Because like you're a, you were a law professor <laughs> at Notre Dame, and you would think I only played a lawyer in a sketch, but I know voter intimidation is against the law. How is it that is Notre Dame that bad a school? No, and she was a very good law professor by all accounts, but evidently. Uh, a will one willing to lie and say i don't know whether that was, is a crime so i that, think one willing to say if i suggest that something is in dispute it goes from being clear to unclear and i really do think like this is her thing okay but but is is this apple red uh, i uh, don't uh, know <laughs> i mean come on <laughs> well but i you know ask the same question was the 2020 election stolen by Joe Biden? Like, we know this. This is not in dispute. But for <laughs> a huge chunk of the country, it is in dispute. And I really do think, like, this is the Steve Bannon thing, is just foster so much mayhem about what is an apple. <laughs> is it red? Is it green? Is it a potato? You know, is it a is it a Tuna, who knows? But now we're all confused. And so the state legislatures should be empowered to just step in and tell us. And this is just freaking classic nihilism to serve the end of authoritarianism. This is like, right? This is this is Tim Snyder. This is Jason Stanley. This is Masha Gessen. Just pushed doubt out. And I think that when she refused to say time and time again to everyone who asked her those yes, no, is this an apple questions, what she was doing, intentionally or not, was saying, you know who gets to decide? I do. I will decide if this is precedent. So uh, uh, what's this gun thing in, uh, <laughs> in New York? <laughs> so there's, there's, the Supreme Court has shockingly few cases docketed, but one of them that it is for sure going to hear is uh, New York State Rifle and Pistol. And this is really the first big gun case that the court will take up since uh, District of Columbia versus Heller in 2008. So basically, in 2008, famously, uh, the court for the first time says, oh, there is a individual right to bear arms, uh, to protect yourself in the home. 
And then that is expanded slightly. Uh, in that's case because that, Washington, D.C. had said you can't have a gun in the home. Right. Yeah, and okay. in, in uh, a case called McDonald, two years later, that's expanded to the states, right? So it's incorporated to the states. And then everybody sits around and waits for the court to tell us more. And the court bats away so many gun cases that Clarence Thomas is like, lighting himself on fire saying like we have to take you know put meat on the bones we've got no clarity on what the rules are so finally now with this 6-3 supermajority at the court the court agrees to hear this New York case and essentially it wants to set aside a New York policy that says that people who are applying for a license to have a handgun have to show in New York that they have a pressing need to do so a handgun that they take outside the home. Exactly. Okay. And uh, this looks like it's going to be the case that and will affect. There are uh, six other states, California, Massachusetts, New Jersey, that have similar laws that you have to sort of show that you have a need uh, to carry your gun in public. And if the court sets aside that New York rule, it is going to sort of reverberate hugely through the country. And I think what I would just say about it is this and Dobbs, which is the Mississippi abortion, 15-week abortion challenge, uh, which are both docketed already for hearing this fall, they'll be decided in June. Between those two, I think, have the potential, even without knowing what else is coming, to absolutely <laughs> reshape the landscape in the sort of image of the 6-3 supermajority. So uh, let's talk about the Mississippi law. How would that make it impossible for a woman to get an abortion in Mississippi? Well, Mississippi, you know, this is a good time to remember that when the court agreed to take this Mississippi case, it was before any of this SB8 shenanigans in Texas. Okay. So initially, what Mississippi uh, was saying was, you know, we just want to have this 15-week ban. And we sort of get that it's totally unconstitutional because viability is at 24 weeks and not 15 weeks. But, you know, fetuses feel pain and and we're going to give it a go. Like you said, you know, we want you to overrule it. We'd rather not have the lower courts overrule it. And the court took it. Uh, again, they waited, 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 waited as soon as Justice Barrett replaced Justice Ginsburg. Uh, then the court agreed to hear it. And initially, it wasn't a big swing. Now, Mississippi fully is asking, and a lot of the amici are fully asking just overturn, bro. Like, that's what we want. We don't want to have, you know, any conversations anymore about pre-viability and undue burdens and blah, blah, and all this doctrine. We just want Roe to not be the law. And it tells you in some sense how emboldened uh, the anti-choice movement has become that just in the course of a few years Al, they've gone from, oh, we just want to have wider hallways in clinics and we want, you know, women to have these scripts that they're read uh, saying that there's a connection between breast cancer and abortion. All that is gone. All that we want women to make good choices is gone. Now we're just trying to overturn Roe. So the court has that. If they want to do that, they can use Dobbs as the way to just write the sentence Roe v. Wade is overturned, in which case, obviously, it will have huge consequences. But I think they can also just do a thing where they fiddle with the viability test. They fiddle with what is an undue burden, how many pregnant people need to experience an undue burden before it's undue. They can fiddle with it, never write the sentence, Roe v. Wade is overturned, particularly it's going to be 2022, right before the election, and still functionally bless all of the states that want to have bans at 15 weeks, eight weeks, six weeks, what have you. So do I think that there are five people at the court now who are willing to do that? Why, yes. Yes, I do. So you think that they'll just come up short of saying, we've overturned Roe, and they'll say something that effectively overturns Roe? That's my guess, especially with these 37% approval ratings going into an election year. But I also think um, having watched what they did 
uh, the first week of September in SB8, where they functionally overturned Roe, at least for Texas's purposes, I'm less sure than I used to be that they care about the optics because the optics of what happened as you started with this, the optics of what happened in Texas and how it happened and how bad the Supreme Court mangled that suggests to me they maybe just don't care what the public thinks. They might just not care and they might be willing to do the big swing. And I think there's a big fracture at the Supreme Court between the kind of make hay while the sun shines, <laughs> you know, we, Clarence Thomas, Sam Alito, usually Neil Gorsuch, who are just willing to do the huge thing now, and Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in Brnovich, uh, do away with the power to organize unions, all the stuff we saw last year, overturn precedent, let's go. And I think there's a much more cautious contingent, which is John Roberts, Sometimes Brett Kavanaugh, sometimes Amy Coney Barrett. And I think in a weird sense, those two factions um, on the court's right are fighting for kind of the soul of the court. And I can't tell you right now what is going to happen in the abortion context. But I do think that that, you know, <laughs> my friend Leah Lippman at Michigan calls it the hashtag YOLO faction, <laughs> you know, just go go, 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 and do it big and do it bold, uh, they may be winning out. This gets me back to, remember uh, during the election, the presidential election, the issue of what do we do about the stacking of the court by not taking up Garland, the obvious hypocrisy of that. And then Biden was asked, will you add members to the court? And I don't exactly recall what his answer was, but it seemed like it was no. But could it have been like, well, you know what? I'll be president for four years. Let me see what the court does. And if they start doing things like overturn Roe, yeah. Because there's no question they've illegitimately gotten uh, at least one of these justices. And so I'm, I'm not, I haven't decided yet. And it depends on how they act. And maybe he could have just thrown the gauntlet down and said, if you do this kind of thing, we're going to go add justices to the court. And maybe that would have constrained some of this. I don't know. That, that's what I was advising the people I knew on, on the Biden campaign, when that was, remember the week or two or three that that was actually in, sort of a viable in play issue of what Biden should say? I, I remember it. And I think this goes back to exactly the point you were making about elections at the top, which is it's fine for Biden to settle on, you know, I'm not going to talk about packing the court. In fact, I'm not going to really talk about anything. I'm going to create this commission. And by the way, it's a blue ribbon commission and the people on it are the smartest people in the world. And they're going to think about it and they're going to take testimony and there's going to be hearings. And then by the way, they can't make recommendations. So I'm not quite sure what they're doing, but this commission would be awesome if this were a problem that we could deal with in 2029. But as you have pointed out twice now in this conversation, this is a problem that we are going to have to deal with in 2022. And the idea that this commission, to its great credit, is looking at a whole bunch of interesting structural solutions, not court packing, by the way, but looking at all these interesting structural solutions, and it has now become a defense so that when the administration is asked, like, what the hell, Texas? The answer is, oh, we have a commission. So it's like the commission is not just not solving the problem, but it's actually taking the problem off the table. And I think that in a perfect world, we could talk about 18-year term limits, and we could talk about jurisdiction stripping, right? There are many, many interesting ideas that this commission is sifting through. And in the meantime, as you say, <laughs> democracy is being dismantled, right? Whether it's the Voting Rights Act, Section 2 last term, whether it is blessing vote suppression, whether it is blessing gerrymandering, we're in the middle of a redistricting complete cluster 
fuck. And all of this is happening, right? Democracy is being warped with the help of the court. And we're talking in like a 10 year range of things we could maybe talk about thinking about doing. And so I think your larger point is, you know, A, (laughs) not a good time to sit around and talk about it. But B, the lack of action, the sense that this is not a serious existential threat just emboldens the court. And I am absolutely sure that if the court really thought there was a serious threat of anything, of any consequences, the court would have been more careful this summer on the eviction moratorium on Remain in Mexico, on COVID restrictions, and on SB8. But with the best of intentions, the Biden administration is like, yeah, we're going to talk about it for a couple months. All the court heard there was they want us to just go, and it is go time. That, that's what anybody hears. If you say, I'm, we're going to appoint a blue ribbon commission, that's a big wank. And everybody <laughs> knows it, right? And that, Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, I have massive respect for the people on the commission, and I appreciate that – the, the 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 story we tell is, oh, FDR tried to pack the courts and he almost tanked to the most popular presidency in history. But I just think that's only half the story because what FDR in failing to pack the courts but seriously threatening to do so achieved was famously the shift in time that saved nine, right? The court blinked and the yep. court changed its behavior. And here we have the opposite. We have no threat and the court saying, Ha ha, like Nelson Muntz on The Simpsons and going further. And so I just think what you are doing in signaling that you are not serious about any kind of court reform is telling the court to just go for it. And that's got to be wrong because TikTok, man, TikTok. Part of that would have been, look, I'm, I'll have my eye on you. If you overturn the ACA, which they probably weren't going to do. But even so, that would have looked like, oh, they backed down. They didn't, they didn't overturn the ACA because Biden threatened to take action if they did. Then it would have made Biden look stronger. Oh. You got me. I well, agree. I mean, I, I, th- this was really upsetting to me because that, you know, I seriously thought they asked my opinion. <laughs> that's on me, I guess. But you should uh, form your own blue ribbon panel. Maybe that's what we should do. Oh you no, form- I just any uh, blue ribbon. Uh, <laughs> never want to be on a blue ribbon panel. Okay. So, uh, what didn't we cover that you were uh, interested in covering? I mean, I think the only other thing, let's throw this in just for fun, is that, you know, we've talked a little bit about guns. We've talked a little bit about Dobbs, the Mississippi case. Those are already on the docket. I think there's a very good chance that affirmative action (laughs) comes back. Uh, There's a challenge to Harvard's affirmative action policy. Again, this is a issue that was decided when Justice Kennedy was the swing vote, but we're in a whole new uh, Which which one is that, the affirmative? Is that the Asian (laughs) uh, thing? That's uh, Asians aren't uh, admitted high enough (laughs) considering their SAT scores? Right. And uh, it's an incredibly clever suit. Um, Again, in a world of precedent and stare decisis, this was already kind of resolved in the Fisher case in uh, 2016, but it's a new court. LBJ said an interesting thing about affirmative action. He said, like, a baseball coach uh, who's trying to put a team together and he's trying people out and uh, timing... uh, a guy from the time he hits the ball till he gets to first base. And he sees someone who's had no coaching and he gets to the first base a little longer than it takes a, a, a kid who's had coaching all his life. And he's saying like, no, the kid who hasn't had coaching, that's the one I want. Cause I can get him the first base faster than the other hmm. kid. Hmm. And I, I, you know, that to me is what affirmative action is about. There, I've said it. it I've said it, it enough. It's so interesting because I'm just remembering, you know, one of Sandra Day O'Connor's famous opinions was in, you know, one of the Michigan affirmative action cases. And she, it, it goes to kind of your point about, 
you know, do you assume that people are generally decent and working toward good ends or do you assume they just want to break stuff? And it's so charmingly dated now that she had put like a timestamp on it. She's like, you know, we still kind of need it. And I'm thinking we're not going to need it because we're just going to be better people. Aww. And, you know, she was like so sweet. She's like, let's revisit this, you know, when we've all like integrated America and there's no race problems. <laughs> and I just want to be like, yeah, the court doesn't write opinions anymore about us all. <laughs> Just working through it and coming out the other side, a better polity. <laughs> like it's so. I would love to quaint. see an opinion by a Alito like that. Yep, that yep. would be hilarious. Yep. Oh well, I I've missed you. We haven't talked in a while, and this has been, as always, a lot of a lot of fun and very interesting, and I hope edifying to our listeners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's. I feel like we're we're we've become a little dire in our old age. You and I, we used to we used to be more sort of rollicking good times, and now we're just screaming that the house is on fire. But I, you know, there's no one I'd rather scream the house is on fire with than you. Well, yeah, but we were. I think we were more sanguine then because things have gotten worse, right? Correct. I agree. Okay, there you go. So it's not us. <laughs> no, it is. It is. It's not us. It's them. Yeah, yeah. It's not us. It's them. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. <laughs>